Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. I am at my apartment in New York City and getting ready to leave for the day. The market is getting ready to open on Thursday morning. It, it doesn't open for a little while more, uh, but I need to go out and face this city today. And it is hot here and humid, and uh, so that's kind of what's in store. A lot of big meetings going on, um, uh, extensive meeting with our emerging markets manager here that I'm going to be elaborating on more next week, um, and of course, our normal flow of client meetings and, and things like that. I'll spare you everything going on with our, our business and what I'm doing here in New York right now these next couple of days, but... Um, uh, let's do, let, let's dive into the the normal course of business for the week, which is of course everything has transpired in the market this week, and and then now as we head into that midway point for the year, and I'm going to dedicate next week's talk to kind of a recap of the first half of 2019 because technically we do still have two market days left. And um, I want to be able to give you finalized data for, you know, we're, we're actually officially going to be at that midway point. Probably by the time you're watching this video, we'll be there. And, and it's been a surreal six months in the market in the sense that we ended 2018 in such an a, a, a environment of distress, a lot of uncertainty, and the impact, I think, of... Uh, uh, Fed monetary tightening that was taking place into Q4 of last year and expected into 2019. And the impact that was having on earnings expectations was so negative uh, when 2019 started and how quickly that reversed on all fronts, the Fed expectations and, and then the revisions higher into earnings expectations has, has created what's essentially been five out of six positive months in the market in 2019 so far. And, and that negative month that took place, the month of May, was reasonably violent for one month. It wasn't violent in the course of all that had transpired with the four months prior to May, but to have, let's call it a five, six percent move down in one month, um, even though we had already had a 16, 17 percent move higher, was was sudden and quick and 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 somewhat uh, traumatic, but then now um, in June to have made all of that back up and then some from the month of May shows you just how um, appetizing good news or hope of good news or seemingly good news has been, uh, indicating a continued risk on paradigm in the market of overall underarching sentiment with interruptions along the way that still has to be defined as a pro-risk, uh, pro-growth market environment. And I think that the question marks that surround around trade are real. Um, and as President Trump has now arrived in Japan for the G20 summit, he'll be meeting with President Xi of China tomorrow, Friday. So we really won't have any kind of information uh, that I think is newsworthy until um, uh, next week or you know, late weekend. We'll be analyzing it more next week. But I don't know. I, I think that indications are that they're planning on some form of truce, that they'll kind of hold back on the escalation of tariffs on another $300 billion worth of imports. And even if they don't get a final deal, um, they'll kind of hit a pause button for a little while and see if these things can't be settled. The headline uh, this morning uh, that was running across the tape when I first got up a few hours ago was, that President Xi has brought a list of the specific things to the meet, that he'll be bringing to the meeting necessary to end this. And, and there's speculation as to what are, is embodied in that and what that would look like, uh, whether or not there's actually going to be um, uh, a, tru a truce or even a constructive move forward or actually if it would aggravate the situation worse. So, so we'll see. But I, I think that the biggest conversation investors are having right now is around the reality that we've now kind of come back to all-time highs or near all-time highs. The S&P had an all-time high last week. The market's reasonably flattish on the week. It had one down day. It's had a couple up days, and, and it's 
again, with Thursday and Friday in front of us, I won't speculate how the week ends up. But I think that that is the um, the question mark that a lot of people have is, oh, what do I do now? s and is back to these levels. And so it is a good time for me to reiterate in this video, one of the most important things that could ever be said about the logic of that thinking, uh, I need to be hesitant when markets are near an all-time high. First and foremost, the reminder I've given so many times over the years, but I have to give it for the rest of my investing career, is that all prices that the market has ever been at were at all-time high at one point. That, that That's the math of how this works. There was a time at which Dow 10,000 was at all-time high. And as we sit here now at Dow 26,500, uh, a couple hundred points off its all-time high, um, the, 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 the price level of the market does not tell you anything about where the price level is going. If one wants to evaluate all-time highs, they need to look to the valuation. What is the multiple that is embodied in the price of the market? Um, meaning price to earnings. Now, there's other multiples or valuation metrics you can look at as well, price to sales, price to book value. But the most common multiple, because markets trade ultimately off of some um, uh, multiplier of their earnings, and, and you pull into the future what you expect to be earning, in, uh, and you pull into the present what you expect to be earning into the future from ownership of a given company. And in the case of a market, it's an aggregation of various companies, obviously. Right now, that market multiple is a little bit high. It's about uh, 17 times forward expectations, about 18 times backward earnings. And we've averaged somewhere between 16, 16 and a half times earnings for the last 30 years. Um, but the very important point is that earnings themselves have been revised upward. And if you get more earnings growth into the future and the earnings ratio, the multiple stays flat, you kind of grow into that earnings. Um, but also that you just basically spend almost no time as an investor right around your average market valuation. Investors spend almost all their time as investors with the market undervalued to its average or overvalued to its average. So trying to make a decision around the exact average point is somewhat silly. Being out of the market whenever it is right above its average uh, median valuation level has, or right below it has never helped anyone in, from a timing standpoint because generally when things get slightly overvalued, they get more overvalued. And when things get slightly undervalued, they get more undervalued. So you really don't have an effect effective timing mechanism around valuation. To the extent someone says, that's all well and good, uh, but I would like to buy things that appear to be less richly valued or more undervalued. I, I spend my career doing exactly that. And we measure that by basis of free cash flow growth and dividend yield and where we see opportunity for companies to be growing the cash flow payments to our shareholders from a earnings multiple standpoint, the only sector, if you're looking at this top down, that appears to be systemically undervalued would be the energy sector. Other sectors are less uh, richly valued than others. Uh, but as far as kind of a very cheap overall market sector, I think energy is the answer there. Um, but no, we're, we're still picking spots across a multitude of sectors where we find individual companies that represent that, that attractive level. To the extent that we get to a point where we think overall market pressure, uh, market uh, factors look too expensive, you you can you you control from your asset allocation the risk levels you want to have on the weightings you're going to have to stocks and bonds and alternatives, and I think that that's um, something we've been effectively doing this year and continuing to do so. Manage that risk. Look, you got a ten-year Treasury yield back to two percent. It was three point three percent less than a year ago. So you've had significant move in bonds, both municipals and taxable bonds have increased in value this year from the underlying interest rates coming down, pushing bond prices higher, and from uh, tightening spreads in the credit market, that, that more risk appetite for credit 
has enabled a lot of the spread sectors in the bond market to improve in value. Do we want to diversify equity risk by putting more money into that at this level? Uh, no, we don't. Now, is there still hedging benefits and diversifying benefits from deflationary pressures in the equity market and the macro economy by being a bond investor? There is. Uh, and, and look, can things get difficult in the economy and have the 10-year bond at 2% come to 1.4%, which, by the way, it did and stayed in the ones just a number of years ago. That's that that becomes a very effective defensive measurement. So a strategic and kind of consistently held position in the bond market is still a good thing. But more and more of our diversification around equity market risk will not necessarily go into the bond market at, at these levels, but, but into various alternatives. And that's uh, something we want to continue talking about. Read DividendCafe.com this week. There's a lot of elaboration about the trade war, about the Fed, and, and then of, about this whole issue of market valuation. Quite a few different charts. Uh, otherwise, I would get into them here on the video. But I think there's four or five charts at DividendCafe.com that I find very useful. So I'm going to leave it there for the week. Get, uh, get all suited up and go uh, start my day here in the world's greatest city, um, and you know how much I love New York. It really is the greatest city in the world. But um, it's a little harder for me to say that uh, with the kind of heat and humidity I'm about to walk into. I'm a pretty spoiled Southern California kid, but that's all right. Uh, reach out with any questions, any comments. Enjoy your weekend. We'll be sending you the video next week on Wednesday just because we'll leave you alone going into the 4th of July weekend. So Wednesday, July 3rd, we'll, we'll have our normal uh, podcast and video and the, the written commentary, dividendcafe.com. Thanks again for viewing, watching, listening, and reach out anytime, any questions, any comments. Mm -hmm.